Hi, hello. My name is Silvan Jorgerius. Thanks for having me today. I'm with a small consultancy company in Berlin, Germany called Stack GDPR. And I'm talking today about GDPR compliance and privacy for blockchain and for deep tech. Um, so where this came from is basically I've always been interested in two things, right? One is decentralization. Um, became fairly big in the last 10 years. And basically decentralizing control and, and basically increasing, increasing privacy, increasing uh, the possibility for individuals to act on their own behalf without intermediaries. And the second thing is privacy itself. Now, these things, um, in practical terms, they often relate to, to blockchain and also to GDPR. Um, and where you can see that decentralization and privacy are two concepts that, that work very well together. Actually, the practical implementations of them, so blockchain and GDPR, are sometimes a little bit more difficult. Now, the company that I founded a couple of years ago, Tech GDPR, has actually specialized in these kind of specific problems. So what we do is, is for example, for, for cryptocurrencies, for blockchain uh, providers, development houses, um, also for uh, exchanges, for example, blockchain protocols, uh, self-sovereign identity, verifiable credentials, etc. We help them figure out how to deal with the challenges of the GDPR, and that is on one side how to ensure that you that you meet the the requirements for uh, for the GDPR uh, for, for for compliance, and on the other side how you build better privacy-friendly products. Right, so for me to talk about uh, these elements today, let's quickly look at some of the key properties of, of blockchain. Let's, let's recap them before going into the details about privacy and GDPR compliance. Right, so we know that blockchain is Im immutable. The moment that you've written something on the blockchain, it cannot be changed anymore. Uh, we know that it's distributed. The information is sent to different nodes and to different, uh, to different endpoints uh, so that information goes everywhere. Um, it is timestamped, so there's a timestamp attached to all the information out there. It is transparent. It is also permissioned, uh, permissionless, uh, depending on the type of blockchain. And there's, it's, it's, it's excellent for the transfer of value, as you can see with, with Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the other cryptocurrencies out there. Um, we also see that there are different blockchain types out there. Uh, the most common one, possibly public permissionless. Um, there's also public permissioned, not so common, and private permissioned. And then there are different hybrid types that, that use elements of both. Now, this is important for further understanding how the GDPR poses a challenge to these different blockchain types. Um, the other thing that I want to quickly recap is, is hashing. So, uh, the blockchain uh, intensively uses a concept called hashing. And hashing basically is converting uh, values of arbitrary size to values of fixed size, and that always takes the same kind of format, always the same length, and the same kind of character sets can be used. Now, that is important in, in blockchain to, uh, to link the different blocks to each other, and it also creates a trail of, uh, of, of confirmation between these blocks. And then the other thing that can be done with, with hashes uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 the, in the area of personal information is that um, hashes are being used to, for example, store only confirmations of personal information instead of the personal information itself. Uh, it can also be used for certain verifications of, of transactions, of uh, certain information. And that is important to keep in mind when going through the rest of, these, uh, of, the, of, the, of my presentation in, in terms of understanding how the balance is between the GDPR, privacy, and blockchain. Right. So then let's have a look at what the GDPR requires. So the GDPR stands for the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, has been in effect in all of Europe since 2018, May 2018 to be precise. And basically requires from everyone in all these member states, but also of companies that are basically delivering goods and services uh, to Europeans or monitoring behavior, um, observing people in Europe to meet the requirements of the GDPR. And these are somewhat uniform across all the different countries and, and have all, this, all the different requirements, even though there can be on a country level or a member state level, as we call it, uh, there can be small differences. 
The principles of the GDPR, and if there's one thing that you take away from what the GDPR requires, it would, in my, uh, in, in, in my vision, be the principles. Those are the most important things to look at. Um, they revolve around lawfulness, fairness, transparency. So you need to be transparent about what data you process of whom. You need to be fair about it. And of course, it needs to be lawful. Um, there, there needs to be a purpose limitation. You can collect data also, like only for a certain purpose. And then uh, one thing that you're not allowed to do is then suddenly change the purpose and start using the data for other things that you haven't communicated to the data subject up front. Data minimization is an important point. Uh, you should only collect the, the minimum amount of data that you need for the given purpose. Data needs to be collected in an accurate way, kept in an accurate way. There needs to be storage limitation, saying like, okay, we keep this data forever, is basically out of the question under the GDPR. Um, there needs to be integrity, confidentiality, uh, and, and the most important point probably is that as a controller, as uh, someone who is responsible for that data collection, you need to take accountability for it. That basically means that you make sure that you can always explain why have you collected that data, how are you dealing with it, how is this in, in line with the GDPR. Even though uh, the GDPR may not be specific about all the little things, you need to take responsibility for it for the uh, collection of that data. So there are roles under the GDPR, uh, which are clearly defined, very clearly defined. There's the, uh, the data subject, that's the, naturals, the natural person whose data is being processed. There's the controller, uh, who's primarily responsible for that data collection, determining the purposes and the means of the processing of that personal data. And then there's the processor, who only processes that personal data on behalf of the controller. And that needs to be on specific written instructions, otherwise there's no controller-processor relationship. So controller has the most responsibility and the processor has a little bit less responsibility. And then there are certain mixed forms. It is also possible to have joint controllership over data if you jointly determine the means and the purposes of collecting this personal data. Right, then there are certain legal bases and you always need to find one of these legal bases that justifies the collection and processing of this personal data. There is consent. We've been speaking about consent a lot in this, in this scene, um, but consent is not always the, the best form. Of course, consent is asking someone, hey, can we process your personal data, yes or no? Um, the problem with that is, is once someone has consented, they can also revoke it. If, uh, if you're looking at um, processing data on a blockchain that is immutable, that is not a great legal base to take because if someone revokes it, you are not able to delete it. Performance of a contract is something that is also a legal base. If you need to process the data for the performance of a contract or the conclusion of the contract even, you can claim that you have that right and that base for, for processing that data. Um, there can be legal obligation. If you, if you need to, by law, uh, process that data, then that is certainly something that, uh, that you can use as a justification for processing data. There are some things that, that don't really apply all that often, like uh, protecting vital interest, mostly in medical situations, um, or a task in the, in the public interest or authority that could also be used. And then there's legitimate interest. Legitimate interest is something that is in your or in someone else's as a controller. Let legitimate interest and if you can say, okay, I need to keep this data for two weeks to keep log files on my server to make sure that it's not being compromised, then that is a valid legitimate interest that you can claim. You just need to do a, a justification, a balancing exercise of it, but you don't necessarily have to, um, have to ask anyone for permission, for example, right? Now, the interesting point here is also around compatibility. So how are the, the GDPR, uh, the privacy regulations, and blockchain compatible? And there's certainly a little bit of misalignment if you want. Um, for example, the storage limitation, the principle of storage limitation, um, doesn't really go along that well with blockchain's immutability, right? Then there's confidentiality, for example, um, where you would need to keep data that you collect confidential. Um, that is also a little bit against the, uh, the, the principle of public blockchains where everything is made public and distributed to everyone, right? The um, accountability principle is even a little bit difficult in certain blockchain situations because the question is sometimes who is actually responsible? 
And uh, if you if you if you if there's like one server uh, under the control of one company that is processing this data, that's fairly simple. But if you would have a look at uh, distributed distributed networks where controllers are all over the place, this is not that simple. So how, let's have a look at that. How it's different. So if we look at the um, the classical situation where in terms of control uh, we we used we used to have like one central point in the middle that maybe your bank or a service provider that collects all the data is very clearly responsible for for all that, right? Um, but in distributed networks, this is a little bit more difficult. There may be a node that may receive information, sends it to all the other nodes, and then another node may receive information or, or start processing information and share it with everyone. So the big question, who is controller, who is processor here, is actually a big question mark. And um, what is interesting as well is like there, there are still ongoing discussions, and it depends a lot on what the data is being used for, what data makes it on chain, um, how the whole governance works, etc. And determining like who is controller and who is processor in these kind of specific circumstances is something that's quite a challenge and, and that we work on quite a bit to help our clients with. Um, the, the other interesting observation here is that while in terms of um, data and data flows, we go basically from one central point to everyone is a central point. Everyone could be sharing data, collecting data, processing data. We don't know anymore, right? But still, because we have one version of ledger with blockchain, we go in the other direction, back to one central point and have one version of the data. So for data governance, that can actually be, be very, very interesting. Then around the right to be forgotten, and that is, that is one of the, the fundamental rights or the rights that you have under the GDPR as a data subject. You have the right to request your data to be deleted, depending on the exact circumstances, but there is, if there's no uh, legal base that still applies, um, there's normally you have the right to be forgotten. Right? Now, that has been very often put against uh, the, the, the blockchain's immutability. Right, the, the Article 17, right to erasure and, and, uh, of the GDPR against the blockchain's immutability. But what is important to observe as well is that, that even the right, Article 17, the right to erasure is not an absolute right. So there's some relative factors in there. As I said, it depends on the legal base. If you pick the right legal base, you may be able to deal with this. And blockchains are also not per se always immutable. Many of them are, um, but it, it doesn't have to be there. Like even in the original Bitcoin white paper, there was a concept called pruning that's been not implemented very widely, but it's certainly a technical possibility, right? So there are ways of finding solutions, but it's always looking at both the technical side and the legal side and finding the right combination that works for your circumstances. And of course you need to think about, okay, how do actually um, these, these, this personal data, how is it, um, is it something that, is, that has to be on chain? Perhaps it doesn't have to be on chain and you find very different possibilities for, uh, for doing that. Perhaps you keep your data off chain, for example. So let's have a look at, at a few um, elements of personal data. So let's imagine if I hash the data in my passport, right? So my photo, my, um, my name, uh, my details, etc. And we make a hash out of that. Then the question is, is this actually personal data? Even though someone may not have my passport or may not have this data, it may well be that if, if this data makes it on chain and my passport services somewhere, that um, by having the passport and by having the algorithm that makes this hash, we could possibly reconstruct this hash and see where it previously interacted with the blockchain. So certainly something that we need to be careful of, just hashing personal data and putting it on blockchain. So what I'm saying is a hash is often not good enough. But if you would add a key that can be deleted, that is not known anywhere else, which would result in a completely different hash, there may be a possibility again to, uh, to store this on chain. So it's all about these little details. Some other obvious problems are that there is a lack of experience dealing with blockchain and, and GDPR. Um, blockchain is new, GDPR is new, so there's, there's not too much knowledge about there. And even though there are some good papers about it, there's still a lot of discussion amongst experts as well 
about how this should work and how this how this could actually um, be in compliance together. Um, lack of court decisions, so we don't really know yet what the courts think. There are a couple of things, but nothing around blockchain yet. Um, lack of guidance, there's a little bit of guidance from the regulators, not that much. It's an emerging technology, so it keeps changing. The regulation is new, there are local implementations. And uh, last but not least, there are also huge fines for it for not complying to the GDPR. So it's a risky area. So is there anything positive about it? And yes, I think there is some, something positive and actually quite a few positive things about it. So there is some visionary alignment. For example, the transparency article or the transparency principle um, is, is met very, very well. Like if data is kept on chain, you can easily see what's kept there. Everyone can access it and there's nothing hidden. It's, it's, you don't even need to think about um, how to communicate it. It's, it's normally public in the public chain. Data minimization. Um, so if you only store hashes of data, that's certainly a minimized form of storing data and you're certainly not going over the top with the kinds of data that you, uh, that you process or that you, that you are um, working with. Also, um, in terms of, of uh, giving people control over their own data is something that's very well possible using self-sovereign identity. And the other thing that's possible as well is to store personal data off chain. I mentioned it before already. So if we would, for example, be looking at, um, at certain data that's, that's in a database, um, there may be a first name, a last name, a zip code, and an email address. The one the, the thing that you need to have on blockchain in many cases is just the confirmation of that. So you have this one central place where you can, where you can have a look at, okay, how um, can I get a confirmation of this data? Is this, was this um, present at a certain point in time? Was this something that, uh, that, that, that really was there? Who put it there? Is it still there? Has it not been revoked? This kind of information is important to have on a blockchain, but perhaps the personal data itself shouldn't even be there. So there's always a possibility to build these combinations. There are very old principles from the 90s already called privacy by design, but this is valid more than ever with, with blockchain, with new kinds of technology. Um, privacy by design basically requires you to, to think about privacy from the very beginning. Uh, make sure that in terms of, uh, in, 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 in the, that a product is designed in such a way that you can always um, can always claim, okay, we thought about privacy from the beginning. This is how we do it. This is how it complies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. Then, what is actually next? What do we need to look at in this scene of, of blockchain and privacy? So, I think we one of the things is also keep looking at new technical solutions. The laws are there. The laws are there to stay. They are not going to, going to change. But technically, there is still quite a Quite, quite a bit that we can do. Um, if you may have heard about zero knowledge proofs, for example, um, these are providing some solutions uh, where you can prove certain facts um, only uh, like with, without revealing anything else than that fact, right? So you don't have to look at personal information to, to use an algorithm to prove that someone is who he says he is. This is great for privacy and this is something that's, that, that builds heavily on blockchain technologies and can therefore be very, very interesting in this space. What the regulator can do, or what is there already right now, is a little bit of guidance. So certain guidance is there around hashing from the Spanish authorities. There are some specific blockchain guidance from the French authorities, the European Data Protection Board, the highest authority in Europe on uh, data protection is working on guidance for blockchain. Um, so there are certainly, certainly these kind of things that, that can help, right? So what can the regulator do? They can, for example, um, issue clarified guidance. Um, there's there's a lot of there's quite a bit of a gap. Um, what we figured out through a working group effort, um, in in terms of what information is available, how clear that information is, how well it is distributed, and how much the regulator actually has said about blockchain and how it can be used in accordance with the GDPR. Um, updated regulation could work perhaps at some point. The GDPR is up for review every now and then, so this, this could be a possibility. Um, but also the other thing that can help, and it sounds very harsh, but it's actually very important, is that fines are being issued to non-compliant projects. That also gives clarity and that also explains us what can be done and what cannot be done. 
And then what am I doing, right? So in terms of putting your money where your mouth is, um, with TechGDPR, we help companies in, in this area, like technology companies, mostly blockchain, but also AI, IoT, um, some, some e-commerce companies, etc. with their compliance and solving their, their specific compliance and privacy issues. Um, the other thing that I briefly mentioned before, um, within an organization called INATBA, the International Association for Trusted Blockchain Applications, I'm also uh, working on certain privacy topics as the, as the co-chair and the initiator of the privacy working group. And for example, uh, we've been working on a, on a broad survey where we asked uh, blockchain companies to indicate what the biggest problems are with privacy regulations. Um, and we've been working on a report um, that, is, that is asking lawyers around the world to also reflect on how privacy regulation reflects on blockchain technology in their particular jurisdiction and putting that together. Right, so that's what I'm doing. Um, thank you so much for, for listening to me. It was a true pleasure speaking for you. And uh, please reach out, uh, find me on LinkedIn, uh, on, on Twitter, or just send me an email. My details are right over here. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.